All right, we're live. Over to you, Matthew. Okay. Hi, everyone. I am Matthew Miller, and this is a Fedora Council video call, video meeting. We haven't had one of these in quite some time, so it's good to start this back up again. I'm happy. Thank you, Justin, for arranging this. Um, basically, the Fedora Council, well, we try to get our work done not by just it, by having weekly meetings, but it turns out that weekly meetings um, kind of help us make sure we advance everything. Um, and so we do that. And every now and then, maybe about once a month, we do a video call to do kind of a high bandwidth thing where we're all in the same place and can ask questions. And usually we focus on some particular aspect of the project we have an uh, interest in as a council or that we want to you know, learn more about, um, work on, focus on, tell, show people about, and so on. So uh, this month, this week, we have uh, some people from the Fedora Accessibility team uh, working on you know making the project easier to use and better and more open to people who maybe need assistive technology or just um, want to oh my alarm's going off that's amazing okay let's put that away um, yeah uh, so anyways we have uh, Lukash and Voita here who are going to tell us about the work there I think this is really important uh, it came up as a key part of the Fedora strategy when we were talking about that. And also as we're moving to Wayland, that really has uh, been something that's kind of been focused in social media. So I'm gonna go uh, turn off my alarm and I'll turn over the uh, program to everyone else. Okay, so I suggest the following. Uh, just let me know if you're okay with that. Uh, first, we would like to introduce ourselves very briefly. And then we actually prepared some things which we would like to present to you. Uh, first part will be partially our presentation we, we already did in the past. And it nicely summarizes the accessibility, the issues which are connected with accessibility of Linux desktop. And then with Fedora. And then in the end, we also prepared like a few slides where we go into more details and we would like to spark a discussion and to be honest, also to ask you for some considerations, opinions, and maybe a little bit of help or advice. Yeah, that sounds yeah. perfect. That's exactly what we're here for. So let's, Great. thank you. So, so uh, uh, Okay, so very, very quickly we'll introduce ourselves. Uh, my name is uh, Wojta. I'm working as a software engineer at Red Hat in the security compliance team. And I'm blind and I'm a Linux user for more than 14 years. Uh, so yeah, I'll quickly hand it over to Lukash. So my name is Lukash. I'm also working at Red Hat, but in the desktop team. I'm also completely blind and I'm using Linux for let's say six years and we will start with the terms and basics. So Voita, it's your turn. So before we start, I, I think it would be also fair to introduce two more people from our groups who are here, and that's Viera and Yiri. Uh you can say Hello. something very, very shortly. Hello, I'm, I'm Iriana from the desktop uh, QA team. Welcome. And hello, I'm Vera. I'm from desktop QA as well. And uh, I work there as a manager. So I'm trying connecting people. And we forgot uh, Bohdan. So Bohdan, please go ahead. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry about this. Not forgotten. Oh, oh yes. Hello, I'm Bohdan, and uh, I uh, work in desktop QE uh, as well. So testing desktop, and uh, I specialize in testing accessibility. It's, it's uh, great to have you here in Fedora. We've often had the uh, the Red Hat desktop team has uh, QA. QE team has been very separate from Fedora QE. So um, that's a really nice bridge to have here. Thanks. 
Thank you. So uh, I'm not sure if you get out easy or sharing the slides. Uh, we are sharing. We are sharing. Okay, great. So uh, I will start with a little bit of terminology, we're talking about accessibility. I hope it won't be that much boring. I will try to move through that in some reasonable pace. So if you, if Vera, you can go to the slide, uh, which is just after the our introduction, basically. What is accessibility? So let's go through that very shortly. Uh, the ex word accessibility will be used quite a lot during this uh, meeting, I believe. And the, in the end, what we mean by accessibility here is accessibility of Linux, desktop, or blind, and possibly visually impaired users. Uh, and since we are at the Fedora Council, we are talking about accessibility of Fedora. Accessibility means that if I, as a blind user, sit at the computer where Fedora is running, I'm able to interact with the desktop environment in a meaningful way. That means that I can get the information which is displayed on the screen, be it in a, I don't know, be it a, a text in a text editor or uh, information about a website or a time or the, the button which is currently selected and the button which will be activated when I press the space bar. If in the ideal world, I would be able to get all the information I need, it has its limitations, but there are many information which, uh, many kinds of information I would like to not have. And also it's not only about receiving the information, but also about interaction. So I want to be able to, to type text, to click buttons, move various controls uh, of a desktop environment. Uh, which, uh, as we will talk about later, is not always the trivial as it sounds. Uh, next slide, please. So just very shortly, why I think that the Linux desktop should care about accessibility, actually. Uh, one thing is that basically we have three big desktop environments here, Windows, Linux, Mac OS, not in any particular order. Uh, and the Linux is the only one which is uh, free and open. And I believe that in certain situations this might be very important especially when considering education combined with different conditions in different part of parts of the world and stuff like that uh, it's a gateway to information and in general computers are very huge improvements to lives of blind and visually impaired users and i i think that linux should be part of this uh, not talking about the fact that it's often used as like a work tool. I think we are pretty good examples here. Uh, like without accessibility to desktop, we definitely won't be sitting at this Google Meet and having a presentation. Uh, next slide, please. So very briefly, what is the state of the desktop accessibility in Linux? Well, I have good and bad news. Good news is that when you are slightly advanced or intermediate user, you can actually do quite well, uh, but you have to be prepared that sometimes you have to overcome some obstacles, some, some things work just partially and you have to modify this and there. But uh, in general, when you get your environment set up correctly, you are able to do a lot of things uh, quite efficiently. Uh, the bad news is that um, for if you are a beginner, you have quite considerable problem because beginners usually don't come out of the blue. They usually transfer from different operating system or they have an experience, previous experience with operating system, where uh, I would say that the readiness and like the state, the polished state of the accessibility is at the higher standard. Yeah, that, for example, people, we were running uh, workshops about Linux accessibility a few years ago, and uh, people from Windows are just, or people who use Windows in the past are just used to the fact that everything, really everything is working, yeah, that, that there, there is not a single icon in the, in the panel which for any reason would not be accessible. 
this is getting better in Linux, but it's it still has problems which we should be aware of. Uh, next slide, please. Some very basic terminology. We'll go through this very quickly. Screen reader is a piece of software which I am actually using right now to read the slides. Uh, and it basically conveys the information displayed on the screen to me in a form of speech output or also in a braille output because I'm having a braille display in front of me as well. Just FYI, this is quite important when you are a software developer. It can simplify your life quite a lot. And then I'm mentioning speech synthesizer here separately because it might be confused with the screen reader. These the speech synthesizer is only actually not very smart piece of software which transfers text into speech. And it might be completely separated from a screen reader. And as I said, you actually might not use it at all, the speech synthesizer. So just, just that these terms are not mixed up. Uh, voice synthesis, okay, it's written voice synthesis on this slide. Um, next slide, please. So. Now we are getting to the key, or one of the key parts of these presentations, how how to make these desktop uh, environments accessible. So first thing is to ensure that the proper things are at their proper place. We call it accessibility stack here. A part of this stack is a screen reader, as we saw at the previous slide. Uh, some associated libraries, uh, speech synthesis, uh, proper desktop <clears throat> environment settings and stuff like that. Basically, if this is not met, then any follow-up steps which are outlined here will not have much effect on the end user experience. Yeah, because if the screen reader is not there, you can have perfectly accessible desktop environment, but you know the screen reader we will not be able to use that. When this is done, and it's not that difficult problem as we will see, uh, then we should start ensuring the accessibility of the desktop environment itself. There are some, I would say examples, I would say like guidelines which could be followed. That the screen reader can be actually started, that the icons, panels, indicators that they are accessible. Again, that means that when we interact with them, we get the meaningful information uh, out of them. Uh, and so at the first place, that we are actually able to interact with them, that they are reachable for us as, uh, as uh, blind users. So that means that we can use a keyboard to reach them, which is not always the case, as we will see later. Uh, keyboard shortcuts, they are very important for us because like, we, we use them to be efficient. For example, without uh, instead of clicking, through Windows, we use keyboard shortcuts to switch among them. And the continues probably on the next slide. Login screen, I have it here as a separate uh, separate thing because it's so forgotten. And it's very, very important part of the desktop environment. So if, if you are not able to log in, then you have a problem. And it should be documented. Then, uh, then we can move towards the apps provided by the desktop environment. And later, another part, which is probably out of scope of this meeting a little bit, is, uh, is the accessibility of third party desktop applications. So, this slide, next one, uh, is a bit of what we learned from the past. Many people said, okay, so this is quite, quite complex. I think it would be a great idea to create a special distribution for blind users, yeah, because, you know, it requires a lot of work, it requires a lot of patching, things which don't work. And so let's put it into a separate distro because then you can customize it however you want without impacting others. You can like package those special apps, you can modify the settings and stuff like that, and everything, everything will be uh, just green. Uh, unfortunately, this just doesn't work for several reasons. One of the reasons is that these distributions, and I, I uh, used at least three of them 
in in my past 14 years uh, are usually maintained by volunteers uh, who just are not able to to keep up with all the things which are necessary to keep the distribution alive yeah so upstream change is something they need to react they need to uh, fix bugs uh, create uh, live images uh, and stuff like that and this is just not feasible for a single person or two people doing it in, in the spare time and another thing is that basically this approach looks nice but it's only like hiding things it's uh, only trying to fix things which should work in first place why should why should we I don't know, modify some configuration to enable accessibility when this configuration can be modified in the original distribution. Um, I don't say that these distros should not exist, like uh, they have their place, but I don't think it should be our goal or our solution. So uh, that's my part of the presentation. Now I will be handing over to Lukash, who will talk a little bit about our real experience and our testing with it in Federal. So, Lukash, over to you. Yes, certainly. So, we wanted to know how the accessibility is actually when you just download uh, some random live image and boot it and try to make it speak. So, we did the first and majority of the testing uh, before positive in january and then uh, we did a second test uh, before this year's defconf and we <coughs> selected uh, basically fedora and all of the at least somehow promising spins so it was uh, the workstation van kde made and so on but we wanted to know also how ubuntu fares so we tested their images as well and when we did the testing in January, we found basically three groups of results. The first, where Federal Organization was, the majority of uh, Ubuntu images were, was that everything was uh, at least the basics of starting the screen reader and reading something was okay not uh, counting uh, the desktop environment specific issues because we had a much bigger issue because uh, on the majority of uh, the federal spins there was no screen reader no speech synthesizer and no <sighs> i well the middleman between Orca and speech synthesizers weren't there as well. So these live images uh, were quite hard for newbies to make speak. And we had, of course, uh, last group where you had some pieces of this accessibility stack but uh, some of them are missing. And then, of course, you have uh, made where the accessibility pieces are there, but uh, there's no accessibility shortcut. So <clears throat> we wanted to do something about this situation, and it turned out that making the majority of federal spins at least talk wasn't so hard and the waiter was doing this so will you tell us exactly what you did sure thank you just very briefly uh basically it 
turned out that the task is relatively simple. The only thing which was needed was to interact with the Federal Composes repo. And uh, what I did was that I created a new software group uh, containing these accessibility tools and added it to all relevant two environments. So basically the longest time I spent on that was learning how to work with Federal Composes and that was it. So at the point why I'm saying is this is that it might look very might look very difficult, but in the end, the fix might be actually pretty simple. I'm not saying this is true for everything, but but, uh, but uh, sometimes it is like that. Yeah, back to you, Lukas. So when this thing happened, we have another table of the testing results, which uh, looks like much better because basically now all the Fedora desktop spins head for the screen reader and we can start solving uh, the individual environment issues. Like for example, some weirdness in KDE where the accessibility is partially working when you start Orca and you need to log in again but uh, these are much uh, i hope that these things can be fixed because now when we can use these <coughs> images we actually want to use them and we are at the end of this first presentation so if you have any questions go forward but we have uh, another presentation waiting as well yeah so it's up to you if you want to like the, the, the next presentation will be more about us and what we do and what we what you could help us for example to achieve uh and it's shorter than this one i think so it's up to you if you want to have questions now but we can postpone it later Mickey, you're muted sorry double secret mute better um yeah uh, i will throw in some questions now then i think or i, ha I have one in particular so um i don't need text to speech or speech to text for um, accessibility reasons, but I often find it convenient, and particularly, you know, I'm interested in home automation, and the whole talk to my house thing has been something since, you know, science fiction in the 50s. Um, I am really interested in uh, AI-based text-to-speech, uh, particularly, but also speech-to-text um, models and um, how that's being explored in open source. My experience with text to speech has been disappointing in the last 20 years. Um, Festival being kind of the like the best open source engine, but also an academic project that's a shambling mess. And I think Orca is, you know, or sorry, the whatever the thing, eSpeak, the things behind that are seem pretty bad at pronouncing a lot of things and having kind of a natural diction. I mentioned this on social media and someone else who was blind said that they actually prefer the simple robotic kind of um, text to speech to generative models. I'm I'd really be interested in hearing your experience with that and what do you think the the potential is? Okay, uh, I can answer that because I can probably complement. Uh, go forward. Thank you. I think this is quite like a matter of personal opinion. For example. So first, uh, there are other uh, speech synthesizers for Linux which could be considered. One of them is recently RH Voice, uh, which is still not comparable with the generated speech, but it's the, I would say it's better than Speak and Festival. And I also did very very quick experiment experiments with, uh, and now I'm not sure how to pronounce it correctly. It's 
cocky or something. Yeah. And that's something uh, which looks quite promising. Uh, it's it's a generative. It's it's a it's a model which you can basically run in a container and it should generate speech. Uh, that's one I was playing with too. I, mm -hmm. I was I was impressed personally. Yeah, I'm not sure how useful it would be with the screen reader where the uh, delay or let's say the yeah the delay is very noticeable. So the how how fast it would be able to generate this speech. But back to your question. Uh, for example, me personally, I'm using eSpeak on my on my uh, computer and on my phone because yeah it's like the voice is not pleasant but it's fast and it's very uh, it's hard to miss it yeah it's hard to overhear it so I can for example hear it even in a noise environments but at the other hand I use it mostly when working but when I want to read a book for example I use something different uh, I read my books on my phone so I'm using like Google TTS so, yeah but uh, so I think it's a matter of preferences uh, and matter of use case oh, Luca, do you have anything to yeah, well, to I am at basically the same place as Voita but uh, I want to solve the book reading use case uh, on the computer as well but I didn't have the time to look into it so far but I definitely want something much better than eSpeak for book reading. And I think that uh, there, the latency of the generative models should, could be OK, actually, because the, these uh, texts are quite long, and you probably should have enough time to prepare the rest. But uh, I didn't try integrate uh, making anything so far. So we will see. Yeah. I, I expect that the uh, latency problems will get better, especially as you know, newer laptops come out with accelerators that we can use with open source. Um, I think that'll be exciting. Um, and I think also, I, I'm excited about the potential to tailor, like, uh, the, the personal preferences for each user. So if you want something that has a more even diction, you may be able to get that just for you um, in, a, in a way that you might not with something like, you know, the, the um, other, the, the not AI based models. So I, I, I'm really glad to hear your experience. Thank you. Maybe Bodan will ask, see if your question is about the AI ML. I'm going to ask a question in a different direction. So I just want to see if you wanted to ask on that or if I should go ahead. Uh, I don't know. I just uh, want to uh, make a note uh, about the uh, uh, synthesizers. Uh, one uh, important uh, detail is that uh, blind users uh, uh, do not use the uh, voice in uh, standard speed but uh, usually very fast and then uh, the robotic voices uh, can be understand uh, better maybe uh, Vojta or Lukash can demonstrate uh, how they use the speech output uh, for example uh, using their phones It would be great if you do it because it's. Uh, I experienced this with with uh, guys and it's really crazy. I mean, like you are not ever used to this. I've never seen it. It's a great like experience. <laughs> I can try that, but I don't know if there will be heard anything. <laughs> No, but it's, it's, it's in check, so I don't know how much it will tell you. But... Yeah. It's quite rapid. Yeah, but now now you can now we can actually uh, see the reason why they want to use the robotic voice because if you have a human voice, all of this gets lost, like all the accents and everything. You will not know what is going on. Yeah, I I wonder if there's a way to actually use the AI models to not tailor it towards um, 
you know, a natural human voice, but towards that fact to being um, clear yet speaking very quickly, uh, which might might be something that is worth exploring. But um, I, I don't want to sidetrack too much on that. I'll go and ask my question then real quick. So in the presentation, you showed the situation from January with Fedora 39. Um, and the state of accessibility on those desktops. And I was wondering after the Fedora comps pull request that was made that added the base package set to many of the different desktop environments, were there a lot of changes to that matrix in 40? Um, I was just curious, what was the impact of landing that pull request on the comps repository for improving the state of accessibility in say Fedora Linux 40, over? Yeah, there were changes. I don't know. Could you get a roll back to these two slides? Maybe it's not clearly visible in the in the table. Uh, but as far as I remember, the big difference was that many, actually most of the Fedora spins which were in the category where uh, we don't have a we, we don't speak, <laughs> uh, switch to the category. Okay, we at least speak. Maybe we are not accessible, but we we uh, we can start the screen reader and and it speaks. Well, does it answer your question? Yeah, and actually, Vera posted. I'm sharing the presentation. Sorry. Yeah, I just saw it there. I don't think we saw the uh, the April. Yeah, sorry, because I I would like to apologize because I use. The older presentation, so is the reason why I send the links into chat and you oh, can see. Okay. Sorry, no. uh, we didn't have updated it on our drive, but yeah. uh, my mistake. But yeah, the chat. You, you can Sorry, see uh, January situation before FOSDEM. It's the first table before changes that Voita made, and uh, second one uh, is uh, uh, results after Voita's. Uh, fixes. Uh, you can see the situation is much better, Voita. If you would like to comment again, please. Um, uh, no, I think like, everything has been said. <laughs> yeah, everything has been said. So you can see uh, it would be better to have it uh, side by side. Side by side. Yes. Yeah, sorry, but you can you can see it in the meet chat, and you can. Uh, look at it, uh, and you will see the progress after uh, this few months. I think the meet chat won't be recorded in the um, the video we save and share here, uh, so we'll make sure to capture those links and post them afterwards. Yeah. Uh, yes. But also, uh, I'm curious, like, what is the impact of Wayland on this? I've heard a lot of people who are unhappy with the state of that. Um, what What is the impact? And I guess, what are we doing? What can we do? What should we do? I and guess sorry, Akash, I've gone past everybody's raising, raising their hand. But uh, I'll, I'll step back and let people whose hands are up go after this. I'm pretty sure this goes to Lukash, this question. Well, the basic. Uh architecture which tells the screen reader what's on the screen it this thing still works as good at as, as it did before so that's good but uh, of course there are some <clears throat> consequences and they are compli more complicated because of uh, GTK4 because at, at the same time as basically Wayland was coming in, GTK4 decided to stop reporting to keepers using some old accessibility API and it let the, basically the middleman getting the keepers is using X11. So as a result of that, the screen reader can't get the keyboard events on Valent in GTK4. So 
for example, you can't even open the Orca preferences in GTK for applications under Wayland. You can't uh, use screen documents to review what's on the screen. So if you can't focus on something, you have no idea that the thing is actually there and you have no way of finding out. And in very, very broken applications, sometimes you need it to emulate a mouse click actually, and you can't do that under Valent as well. So yeah, that's not a, so a huge, huge loss, but uh, it's a loss nonetheless. But the keyboard handling is uh, very broken under Valent. And there's a proposal for an accessibility shortcuts portal, but this thing has only a proposal for, well, I think the issue is sitting on the X, the DG the, the portal repository for a year, and it's still open only with some proposal and comments. So we don't even know what to build and we can't implement this. So this is uh, probably the most important thing which the Valent and GTK4 transition broke. Well, maybe that other graphical toolkits will do the same as GTK4. So the situation will probably be only worse before we implement the accessibility to shortcuts and the keyboard handling right there. That's, yeah, that's the one thing if I could just have a magic wand, I would fix right now. That That's the uh, free desktop proposal. Or, or what, what is what is the magic, what should the magic wand hit to have the most impact, I guess? Well, it would, uh, it would uh, finish the, API portal proposal would implement the portal in, in Matter and ideally in other violent compositors and would implement it into the accessibility layer as well. If you could share some links to that, we'll add that to this as well. And maybe we'll try and use what influence we have to, I don't, it's not quite a magic wand, but we can maybe push a little bit at least. Well, finding the proposal, well, I can no certainly magic, try. No magic ones, but magic bumblebees too. Uh, uh, I, would, I okay. would be okay with them exactly. as well. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I know there are probably some other raised hands. Uh, I see that we have 20 minutes until the end of the meeting. And we still have one shorter presentation, which should be around 10 minutes, uh, and which, as I said, focus on more on our, what we really do in our, in our time. Would it be okay for you if we do the presentation now and continue answering questions later? Yeah, or, let's or... do it. And we can go mm -hmm. over a little bit if, if need be. Uh, this is important. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, yeah. so let's start. So at the beginning, uh, Vera, there is some slide where we again kind of very shortly introduce ourselves. And I would like also to mention that basically all of us here are uh, cooperating with Federal Accessibility Working Group. There is a link to a meeting notes. If you are interested, they are public. So you can also join the calls. We have also channel on the matrix. Uh, and now, uh, Basically, this presentation is, it looks a little bit like a mix of things, but all, all of them have accessibility in common. And they kind of represent the different areas we are working at. Sometimes they overlap, sometimes they don't. So the first slide is to my me, and I'm asking if accessibility should be actually a blocker. Because 
like having the accessible distribution and distribution is a great idea. And I actually really appreciate that accessibility is one of the uh, Fedora uh, initiatives, I think, uh, for several upcoming years. That's really great. Uh, on the other hand, like everything is not, not green and accessibility is often talked about, but when implementing it becomes a bit harder. I think the main reason, especially here at Linux desktop is that it's kind of closed circle. Yeah, that There are not many Linux desktop users who are blind. That means that it's not used very much. Uh, that means that not very, not many bugs are reported. So developers actually are not fixing it. And even if they, if they would like to fix it, they are not, they might not be sure how to do that or whom to ask because the user base is low. And so the bugs are not getting fixed and new users are not coming. So the user base stays low. So it's kind of closed circle. And one of ways I think uh, might change this state might be that we start actively probing and testing for the state of the accessibility. Yeah? That we have some set of tests, we have some barrier, we have some cr criteria which we would like to maintain for federal releases. Yeah? That we, if for example, I don't know, something breaks the screen reader in the way that it's not speaking at all, then we we could we could say, hey, we we are really regressing in accessibility. We don't want to release. We 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 might want to fix that. It's a it's a very big topic, but I, I think it's something worth considering. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, remember, as I talked about the, how problematic it is to create custom distribution for blind. So now I'm kind of doing a little bit of double talk because. Uh, Voitux is one of such distributions with that, which I'm trying to actually develop, <laughs> but uh, I have a little different, little bit different goals. Uh, the, basically, it's a project on GitHub, which is very, very uh, strongly coupled with Fedora. It's basically based on Fedora and trying to provide fixes or package some additional software in the form of RPM packages, which could be later adopted or hopefully integrated into Fedora entirely, for example, some configuration changes. So my short-term goal actually is to provide a Fedora Remix, which would offer these accessibility modifications. Uh, this is basically on par with distributions already mentioned. Yeah. But the long-term goal is actually non-existence of Voitux because it won't be needed anymore because the accessibility will just uh, become the core part of Fedora and it will be accessible out of the box. That would be that would be just great. And basically what, what problem I have with what I'm asking here for is that, uh, so first I'm developing this on my own in my basically free time and also like I also work on that in my uh, working hours, I got kind of I got arranged it like that, but it's still a very small fraction of the time to maintain a distribution. Uh, so what would really help me, what would be to have someone, some Fedora expert, currently mainly packaging expert, uh, involved into this project. The project is on GitHub. Uh, you can find it under Voitux. Uh, so that I would not need to become a Fedora, full-fledged Fedora engineer, my own. And another thing to consider is, this is for long-term discussion, what I would like to avoid is that when I, for example, make the release, the first re official release of Voitux, which still didn't happen, but I hope it will happen, I'm afraid it might end as uh, other distributions, so that basically I will be so overwhelmed with the bugs that I won't be able to maintain the project anymore. So uh, my ask is to consider after this is released as a remix some long-term or backing or support of these of this project it's very abstract it's very high level but uh, i think uh, i hope you get the point and 
and further slides will be presented by Lukash. So the next topic topic is uh, actually how we test the accessibility features and Orca in Rail. So uh, in the last few weeks, Bohdan was writing a new set of tests for Rail 10 because of some technical changes and after some struggles uh, it seems that uh, it goes at least according to the plan so it's quite nice to have these tests <clears throat> these tests are using mostly atspi itself under the hood yeah. and there are some layers on top of them and of course real testing isn't using open qa so <clears throat> we are we are using qa core and related technologies and yeah more information can be found in the article bogdan just posted to the chat so thank you for that and we actually were involved in the last uh, federal testing days where accessibility features were tested and uh, we have some findings and suggestions for improvements of the test cases and so on so let's look what uh, we actually found well we found that uh, actually you probably need uh, sighted testers because because uh, if you aren't sighted you can uh, basically not see some parts of an application even today and so we actually need to fix these issues as soon as possible. The probably more annoying, and we know about that for a long time, is in GNOME settings, where we are using deprecated combo boxes mainly. It well, not mainly, but more most annoying for me for this week at least in the sound settings so orca isn't reading when you are cho choosing a sound output so that's quite annoying to do this thing blind and without any output of that oh that sucks but, i do that all the time and i don't yes, even depend on it i um, think there's related issue as well but I'm Can not finding it right now. I will just finish talking about the slides and if we have some yes. time. Go on. <laughs> well, another thing which we found is that uh, in JDIT, you actually can't reach the line indicator in the status bar. So, well, I didn't even know that the thing is there. I suspected, but I didn't, I never seen this thing. And you actually can access the toolbar, but uh, with a shortcut, which is uh, really unexpected. And it does something really different in other scenarios than this. So this is at least uh, confusing. And on the next slide, we have uh, another some findings because you can have the most accessible thing under the sun but if the thing is uh, confusing and so on it, it may be hard to use uh, nonetheless so we have the weird jedit main menu which is it seems even two dimension or something like that which is basically nothing i seen anywhere else 
except for these applications. And then there's the issue of you know settings and all the libadvai theory and inventing everything from scratch because for visually impaired now everything looks like a set of lists with some items at the items maybe buttons maybe check boxes maybe text spheres maybe radio, radio buttons and it's uh, quite uh, well it takes some time to move through these dialogues because the keyboard sh shortcuts aren't behaving the same way even in one application so we need to do something about this as well well on the next slide you <clears throat> We have a lot of questions from developers about what they can do, how can they make their applications accessible, and we don't want to tell them that there's these uh, 20 or so resources on the internet, but they aren't connected in any way, and they are confusing or maybe contradictory as well. So. In Red Hat, we started to create a, a, uh, something we called the Linux Accessibility Development Guide, which is a document which uh, first documents how impaired users use the computer. I think we have most about visual impaired so far, but uh, we definitely want other impairments described as well so basically what uh, they are struggling with what they are using as a special software or hardware and things so on and then we are there describing the most common widgets which are in applications and we are describing how visual impact use them how they should behave with keyboard and other things. And at the end for each of these widgets, we are describing the technical details. So you can at least try to make them behave correctly on the accessibility layer if you really want to invent them. Of course, you can't implement everything because basically gtk is missing a lot of accessibility apis for reinventing the wheels but well some projects are trying to do just this of course so if you want to help us with the guide we are open for that and i am i must thank our two colleagues that they did actually this in their time we wouldn't be able to be so far in the effort if we haven't them have if we didn't have them so thank you and that's everything for me and yeah maybe we have time for one or two questions I think we should have something like that. I have so many questions. If you can stay past the hour, I would love that. But um, if people have to go, I understand that as well. I have a question. Oh, personally, I think I I can personally stay. I had a question on the guide, but I know before in the last presentation, I saw both Adam and Alexandra had and Alexandra has her hand up now too. Adam, I don't know if you still have your question, but maybe we'll go Alexandra, Adam, and then I'll have my quick one on the dev guide. I have actually less than a question and more than a comment. Uh, this was a really awesome presentation. And as Matthew said, like we have many follow-up questions and ideas and thoughts and so on. So we probably should figure out like the next step also, not just discuss the question. And I personally would like to offer 
uh, help with um, uh, testing, uh, t t automation of the testing on the Fedora query side. And if uh, you're looking for ways to inject tests into the pipeline somewhere, let's talk. And uh, after this meeting ends, so let, let's discuss what we can do with OpenQA or whatever other possibilities of testing, preventive testing uh, there. Because I think um, making like accessibility as a single blocker thing is hard, but we at least should not break things which already work. And this is why regression testing is really very important and can be um, really uh, added in the pipeline now. And uh, at least, yeah, let us uh, improve things rather than break them. That's, that would be the, the first goal for me, yeah. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> Adam? Did you have something you wanted to to add in, or did it already get answered? No, I won't bring us back to the voice synthesis and stuff like that. But thank you for the presentation; that was really good, and you opened my eyes in a few ways, um, mostly about the difference between there's a voice that's very fast for like navigation, and then there's a voice that's pleasant for reading longer things. That's I haven't realized that. That was interesting. And yeah, I would also like to help somehow, at least with the regressions, because that's ridiculous. That's not blocking to me. Then I'll go ahead and jump in here, hopefully with a quick one. But I saw that link to the GitLab repo for the Linux Accessibility Dev Guide. And I was just wondering, it looks like that's kind of like a build, like a documentation build tool. Do you have to? Uh, compile that or build it locally? Or is there somewhere online that I can look that already has it all pre-built for the dev guide? Well, that's uh, a question uh, for me, because I uh, somehow try to administrate this uh, repo. Well, we, we try to, to have automatic uh, GitLab pages, but uh, have some issues uh, uh, now. So uh, it, it doesn't work. Uh, as we would like, but uh, uh, when I have time, I will try to fix it. So we uh, we want it to uh, to be in uh, GitLab uh, pages. Yeah. Okay, definitely. Once you have, or once there's a public link, definitely share it with the accessibility working group chat or in the Fedora Council chat. I think that would be a really helpful resource. And maybe we can look at trying to socialize that on some of our social media channels too, because I know uh, a member of the marketing team is also a huge uh, fan and supporter. Yeah, of this uh, yeah. It, it, it's still work in progress, so it's not complete, uh, uh, but uh, we work on it. And uh, uh, if uh, somebody uh, would like to help with this, uh, uh, you are I welcome. I understand the appeal of having it be a generic thing and not uh, Fedora specific, but it's also maybe something we have, you know, automation building in the Fedora Docs system. We could maybe look at uh, building it there either as well or um, maybe as the main thing and then publish it somewhere else for uh, general. I don't know. But that wasn't my comment. Anyways, continue. I, uh, let me know when we're done with this topic. I've got more things. That was my only question. Just definitely, once there's a public link, I'd love to take a look at it, share it around in some channels that I'm in as well, too. That's all for me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, one, if, if uh, when it's uh, uh, ready for public presentation, we definitely will let you know. But the, the content is still not complete. I don't think that's, a, that's like an issue. Actually, maybe it, it can be incomplete, but but there has to be something that is that is readable or that we can at least present to people. Yeah, the the repo is public at least for reading, so you can look at it. There is uh, some some preview, uh, so you can have uh, some idea of how, how it uh, will look at the end. OK, uh, so on, on to other things here. Um, on, on the subject of uh, 
release blocking criteria. I think this is a really good idea, and I think we should as we should start with what we can do that is simple as soon as possible. Um, basically, that's something be a release blocker. Um, things need to you know, have clearly defined exactly what needs to work, what needs to be tested. Um, automated testing is obviously great. Um, we also need to make sure there are just people to run through the validation, um, which may even just be saying, yes, all of the lights are green on this, um, especially at release crunch time, um, but also continuously. Um, and then uh, it also needs somebody committed to fixing those things at release time. So if we have you know, a release time bug and we can't fix it, um, we can't re realistically make that a blocker. Um, so I think if we can identify those things, uh, Aoife has her hand raised, it probably is to say this should be a change proposal. But uh, if it's something else, uh, or if it is that, go ahead, Aoife. No, actually, but um, it would be a very interesting and I would say well-received change proposal. But what I was actually going to suggest, and it, this may be something that you're you're thinking of already or are doing, and apologies if I'm asking in ignorance. Um, have you considered reaching out to uh, any of our QA, Fedora QA folks, um, Samantha Mukherjee, and doing a test day for some of the accessibility work that you have? I think that was mentioned. Yeah, no, apolog well, apologies. A uh, uh, test week uh, was a week ago, Bogdan, I think, Thank and you. it was organizing by Samantha. Perfect. Well, if you're in touch with him, then you're well ahead. Maybe I'll just do a quick insert there too. Um, Sumantra was one of the points of contact for the test week. And then I put a link in the chat to a ticket that was just opened four days ago um, in the Fedora QA issue tracker about a conversation about what it would take to have release blocking criteria for accessibility. So I'd say if you're interested in that conversation on the QA, QE side, especially like Alexandra on the open QA, this came up yesterday in the accessibility working group meeting about some of the challenges of um, taking some of these things that are done downstream and having them work in open QA upstream. Um, I think that PAGOR issue with the QA team is probably one of the best places to watch for that conversation, on like trying to make it easier to test and automate the tests for quality assurance, but just wanted to call that out. It was a very, very fresh ticket, so it's very new conversation, but uh, that's probably a good place to keep an eye on for that topic. Uh, I actually I will... wanted to disagree a bit with, with this approach because, I mean, declaring release blocker would be a nice thing to do, but I don't believe it's the simplest thing to do because exactly by these issues where Matthew said like someone needs to own, someone needs to track, someone needs to fix. And uh, accessibility issues, usually they are kind of issues which span through components, through the entire system. No one knows where it will like appear, pop and, and like get in your face and, and then you're committed to, to fixing it. So it might be harder to like approach this from the release blocking perspective. That's why I would even rather try uh, with regression testing perspective first, because it gives us the, uh, not at, at release time, we just see the bug and, bug and say like, okay, we cannot release, but rather this is the ongoing automated testing, which we already have like in, internally in Red Hat, we can push it up, upstream in Fedora and like have the same feedback loop happening during the development. So release uh, criteria is an interesting policy question, but uh, I have less hopes that it <laughs> it can be done easily. I would more focus on, on automated testing. I think that's fair and obviously also your passion. So that's, uh, uh, but I, I think that um, there's, we have, there's an area called the basic criteria, which are basically supposed to be functional at all times. It's not just a release thing. I think there's probably some fundamental things which we should probably test at that level um, as well. And uh, yeah, uh, but I'm happy with focusing on automatic testing first, if that's the best approach. So from here, I'm gonna suggest probably we'll take Adam as our last question, and then Matthew, you can wrap us up for the Sounds day. Sounds good. Wait, um, I just wanted to ask that um, 
of course we can't just like flip the switch to make it like a release blocking thing but could we make make it something like an objective for Fedora that we really want to do that and that we're looking for people who are able to fix the things and work on this and like promote ourselves or like promote Fedora as like the distro that's serious about accessibility and that the only blocker is people but like once we have them we're, we're gonna seriously do that um I think yes I think that also goes nicely into 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 my wrap up um, this is something that's part of our strategy 2028. It was identified really quickly by community as something that's one of the most important things to grow our uh, contributor and user base. Um, so I think it, it will be a focus. Um, as we've been going through building that strategy, uh, some other things ended up on our radar as the ones we're focusing on immediately. And this was a little bit outside there but i think it can be one of the things we can pull in next or soon if people are ready to work on it um, and then move towards that um yeah and again thank you everybody for sharing here this was really good and i actually i'm most of all i'm sorry for not having done this sooner we really should have this is really important and i'm really glad to see this um Fedora's vision is a world where everyone benefits from free and open source software, and it's built in an inclusive way. Um, this is fundamental to that. So this is in order for our vision to come true. We we need this. We need your help. We need all of this. So I'm excited about it, and uh, we're we're here to help. Again, thank you very much, everyone, and thank you, Council, for all your participation in this. This has been a very nicely done video meeting. Thank you, Justin. Go ahead. <laughs> Yep, so just some next steps. Uh, first, again, thanks, Lukash and Vojta for the presentation. From here, this recording will get processed, and we'll get this up on the Fedora YouTube, hopefully, within the week. So you can keep an eye out for this recording going live. We'll share it in the Accessibility Working Group and the Fedora Council Matrix Rooms. Thanks so much, folks, and we will see you all next time. OK, pleasure to see you guys. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.